So I'm just going to say each part, and then we'll stop, and then talk about each part, and maybe about suggestions, thoughts about how, about, um, how we can extend things in different directions, or objections, or further ideas. Then once we are done with that, then we'll go on to the second part. And the last thing I want to mention is I really forgot that there aren't any off handouts. I just sort of really radically uh, uh, underestimated like, the number of people who would, who would be here. So I'm really sorry about that. Um, I feel like it, it would become important sort of once we get to the kind of the fourth part that's more formal and more kind of logic -y, to actually be looking at it. So once we get to that part, hopefully, Phil can be sure to share and actually be able to get How to many are you saying? We're in house linguistics. I just wrong. Who well, misses a handout? Would it be helpful to use the document viewer? Oh, well, that, that's fun to work too. So yeah, yeah, but I mean, you can make nine copies of ten copies. Oh, wait, well, that would be amazing. Oh, yeah. No problem. Oh, wait, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Oh, wait, thank you so much for doing this. Okay, we're starting. Oh, do you want to... Uh, okay, so we're going to be talking today about moral disagreement and about how facts about moral disagreement can shed light on questions in formal semantics having to do with the semantics of sentences that express moral claims. So what is the basic idea about moral disagreement? It seems like, in many cases, there's this per pervasive aspect of moral discourse that people disagree with each other. So we're going to suppose that one speaker says, what John did was more than wrong. Another speaker from a completely different culture could say, no, what John did was not morally wrong. In this case, it seems perfectly reasonable for the second speaker to reject the statement the first speaker made by saying no. And it seems clear in such a case that these two speakers disagree. So any semantics according to which these people don't disagree, in which they're not disagreeing with each other, seems to be clearly getting something wrong. And any view that says it would be inappropriate for the second person to say no, to reject the first, first, first person's claim by saying no, is not missing something about the semantics of moral claims. So to bring out what's important about that fact, it might be helpful to distinguish, to kind of compare this moral case with other cases that seem different or similar in certain ways. So as another example, consider a statement that very clearly involves a decimal. Suppose that a speaker in one location says, it's raining here. And now a speaker in another location, say speaking on the telephone with his first speaker, says, no, it's not raining here. Then clearly that second speaker is just messing up in some way. Given we have any understanding of the meaning of these indexical expressions, we understand what it means for it to be raining at a particular location, we understand what the word here means, they should understand that if, you think, if I think it's raining here and someone else in another location makes a statement it's not raining here, we don't really disagree, and hence it makes no sense for the second speaker to be saying no, to reject the first speaker's first claim by saying no. Or to take another case, suppose we take a really straightforwardly factual claim that involves no indexical elements. So suppose that one speaker says something like, Dover is the capital of Delaware, and then another speaker says, from say another culture or a whole other location, says, no, Dover is not the capital of Delaware. Then it seems really clear that two speakers do disagree, and hence that it makes perfect sense for the second speaker to reject the first speaker's claim by saying no. So if we now look at these disagreement facts, what we find is that with regard to these disagreement facts, these moral claims are looking more like the non indexical claim, like Dover is the capital of Delaware, and they're looking less like the indexical claim, something like it's raining here. So it seems now that this fact, this fact about disagreement, is maybe going to show us something about semantics. It's going to show us something about the semantics of these expressions. But what does it show us? What does it teach us about the semantics of these expressions? A pretty obvious thought you might have is that when you make a claim, that claim has a certain content. There's a proposition that you're expressing by this claim. And that when we learn that two people are disagreeing, then we're learning something about a kind of conflict between the contents of these two expressions. So that if we knew what proposition was expressed by the first one, what proposition was expressed by the second one, there's some sense in which these two propositions are conflicting with each other, you might think. And that's what it is for the two speakers to disagree. So there are various different ways in which you could kind of catch this out, what it is for these two things to be in conflict. But here we're going to introduce just one that will give you some sense of what this means. So let's introduce the idea of two contents being exclusionary. We'll say two claims have exclusionary content if, it's, if um, it has to be the case that at least one of them is false. So then you might think, if people disagree, then the expressions of those sentences they're saying have to have exclusionary content. If you thought that, then 
you might feel like we can infer a lot, we can learn a lot from about the content of the things people are saying from this fact about disagreement. So from the fact that these first two speakers disagree in our moral dialogue, we can learn something about the contents of the expressions that the sentences that they're saying. So you might think we can learn that these sentences have to have exclusionary content. So if you thought that was right, then you might think it's going to shed a lot of light on the really important questions of metaethics or on the semantics of moral statements. So you might think for this to be it about whether moral realism is right, or some kind of moral relativism is right, whether moral contextualism is right, whether we should adopt some kind of more complex view like truth relativism, then seeing this fact about, about um, disagreement is going to teach us something really fundamental about this. What it's going to teach us is that these things have exclusionary content, and therefore we have to have this knowledge for these statements that's going to have a consequence that they can't both be right, that if one of them is right, the other one has to be false. So that's the sort of obvious view that you might have about that. That's the view that we're going to be arguing against. So what we want to argue is that that's not the right way of understanding what disagreement is. It's not the right way of understanding what it is for two people to disagree. But if you really understand what it is for two people to disagree, then the right understanding of it is that you can disagree with what, what someone says without in any way thinking that what they said is false. So you can think, someone said something, and the thing they said is true, but you can still disagree with them. So the core thing we're going to be arguing for in this paper is that if you really understand what disagreement is, this idea that from the fact that two people disagree, we should infer that the claims they have, are making have exclusionary content, then that's somehow mistaken. And so we're going to be developing ultimately a semantics on which people do disagree in this kind of dialogue that I initially gave, but in which despite the fact that they disagree, the claims don't have exclusionary content. So the first person, second person is right to say, no, what John did was not morally wrong, but would be wrong to say that what the first person was saying was false. That's kind of what I did. So I'm going to wait just a second and stand up, and then we'll go to the second. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing mostly is talking about very specifically about moral disagreement, about questions involving morality. But before we get to the question involving moral disagreement in particular, I just wanted to kind of make it seem at least plausible that this could be true. That there could be disagreement without exclusion. There could be a case in which you disagree with what, what someone is saying, but you don't think what they were saying is false. So to sort of argue for that, I'm going to talk about three other cases. Three cases that don't involve morality at all, but will just make you think there's something, hopefully make you think, see the idea that there's something suspicious about this inference to exclusionary content. So we're going to talk about three cases. The first is what I'll call modal disagreement. Modal disagreement. So modal disagreement is disagreement <coughs> involving epistemic motives. So suppose there are two speakers, and one speaker says, it might be the case that P. It seems like a second speaker can reject that claim, kind of disagree by, with that claim, by saying, no, not P. So if so one person says, hey, it might be that P, the other person can say, no, not P. And thereby they seem to be rejecting what the first person said. They seem to be disagreeing with what the first person said. But despite the fact that they're rejecting and disagreeing with what the first person said, it doesn't seem like it has to be the case that they think what the first person said is false. The first person said it just said that it might be the case that P. Then when you say that it's not the case that P, it doesn't seem like you have to be thinking that the claim that it might be the case that P is false. So the key question now is, in these types of disagreements, in modal disagreements, do people think that modal disagreements are only possible in this case of exclusionary content? So to go after that question, my co-author, Justin Kuhn, in an earlier paper, conducted a really nice experimental study. So in this experimental, there are a whole series of experimental studies, but I'm just giving you one example. In this study, participants were received the following vignette. In the vignette, they were told, Alex asked Beth, where are the keys? Beth hasn't yet checked the drawer, although she knows she often leaves the key there. So Beth says, they might be in the drawer. As a matter of fact, Jim is waiting in the car with the keys, though Beth doesn't know this. So Beth is in a situation where she says, it might be that the keys are in the, are in the drawer, as a matter of fact, it isn't the case that the keys are in the drawer, but also if you look at the evidence that's available to Beth, this evidence does not rule out that possibility. The evidence available to Beth doesn't rule out the possibility that they're in the drawer. So then, participants were randomly assigned to receive one or two, of two questions. One question is about the truth value of Beth's utterance, and the other question is about whether you should disagree with Beth's utterance. So the people in this condition were asked about the truth value, were asked, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? What Beth said was false, that this epistemic model of Beth's utterance was false. Participants in the disagreement condition were asked a question about whether you should disagree with what Beth said. So they were told, Jim, overhearing Beth's response to Alex's question, runs in and says, no, I have the keys. So here, what, she's, what the person is doing is just saying that the pre-Jason of the episode model is false. And then, and for that reason, disagreeing and rejecting the episode model. So then participants in that condition were asked, how appropriate was, for Jim, was it for Jim to reject Beth's claim by saying no? The result is that these two questions, the question about whether it's false and the question about whether you should disagree with it, get opposite answers. So if people say it's not false, but you should still disagree with it. So when the person says it might be the case that P, 
if you know they're not P, but the speaker's evidence doesn't rule out the P, then the speaker's uh, statement, it might be the P, is not false, but you should still say no. You should still agree with the speaker's statement. So ultimately, we're going to be talking about moral scrutiny, but this really gives you a sense of the formal argument that we're going to be giving. In some cases, people do think it's right to say no, but that doesn't necessarily mean you should develop a semantics according to which the sentence to which you should say hey, no is false. In some cases, people think you should say no to sentences that are themselves true. Okay, let's turn to another case. That was modal disagreement. Let's turn now to a different case. This is the case of imperative disagreement. So you suppose that one speaker says, let's get a coffee. The other speaker could disagree and reject the first person's statement by saying, no, let's get a beer. But in this case, surely the second speaker doesn't say a thing that what the first speaker said was false. The first speaker's statement isn't just isn't that kind of statement that has, has a truth. Why does not true that? It's not the kind of thing that can be true or false. So in this kind of case, you can disagree with someone's statement, you can reject someone's statement, but even though you're disagreeing and you're rejecting it, you're not thinking that that's false. One third example, this is what we'll call a thicker disagreement. Suppose that the first speaker says, some of the students did well. It seems like the second speaker can then reject the first speaker's comments by saying, no, all of the students did well. But it doesn't seem as though we should develop a semantics according to which if all of the students did well, it has to be false that some of the students did well. Instead, it seems like if all the students did well, it is true that some of the students did well. But even though the second speaker and therefore, thereby probably thinks that the first speaker's utterance is true, the second speaker can then nonetheless disagree and reject what the first speaker's utterance is saying. And that's because of the scalar and literature. So what's going on in this case of scalar and literature seems to be that someone can say something that you think is true, but even though you think that what they said is true, you can still disagree with what they're saying and saying no. So the fact that you should disagree and the fact that you should say no doesn't mean we should develop a semantics according to which what they're saying is false. We can still have semantics according to which they're saying is true. Okay, with those three examples in mind, come back to the sort of core question of our paper. The core question of our paper is about this first dialogue. So in this first dialogue, one speaker says what John did was more than wrong, and the second speaker says no, what John did was not. It seems like this thing that you do when you're saying um, it might be the P is something that can be true even if not P, but also that you have to that you should take back if not P. So it seems like what this person is do, would be doing if they didn't take it back is somehow saying, I, in some way, I want to hold on to them, so at least some P words. That you're not just saying, as the dynamics of the conversation proceed, like, now I want to add these P words, but if you further evidence comes to light, you can just go away. It feels like that people say, if you say it might be the P, and you refuse to take back what you said, that you're sort of saying, I want to stay in this state where there are at least some P-worlds. I don't, I, the evidence that exists right now is not just such that we shouldn't change. It's somehow such that it really was right to have these P-worlds in the context. I agree that that doesn't fully address the question. It seems like in some way people are trying to say, not just on, um, if there's some P-worlds in the context, then like, great, everything should stay the same, but like something more like, we were right to have P-worlds in the context. Too then if someone else says, given the existing body of evidence, that we should take them away, they're doing something wrong. We should hold on. Okay, hopefully we will have to have more questions on this test. Okay, so now, in this next section, we're going to talk about how to actually get about a sentence that gives you this result. So before I just have two quick sort of apologies for having it. One is, I apologize for the sudden change of font. Like, it's just that, I was writing all this stuff in Microsoft Word, and then I just discovered I had no idea how to do any of this in Microsoft Word, so I had to switch. The second is that, um, they, even though I was going to say, give a semantics that gives you these results, it's unlikely, of course, that this semantics that we're going to provide right here is going to turn out to be right. I mean, probably will turn out to be wrong. As we continue working on this, on these ideas, we'll turn out that they, this exact thing that we said here is not going to be probably unlikely to be exactly right. But I still think it can be helpful to say things like this. So I think it can be helpful in two different ways. So one is, it just provides kind of an existence proof that there's some way to make good on the sort of broad approach that I was suggesting in the previous century. So we want to understand how, how to make sense of moral disagreement. The core point that we're making is not that this exact thing is true, but that we can make sense of it in terms of this, like, by <coughs> distinguishing the update proposal from the content and saying that moral disagreement involves a con conflict at the level of update proposal that's unaccompanied by this association. <coughs> If we can provide some particular semantics that gives you that result, then even if that particular semantics turns out to be wrong, it kind of gives you more of a sense that that, that broad approach might be sort of very broadly speaking on the right track. And then the second reason, of course, is that often 
if you say something in particular, it kind of helps you on the path to ultimately finding the right answer. But say you say something, then as we continue exploring that one particular idea, probably it will turn out to be a mistake in certain ways, but our exploration of those mistakes can help us to ultimately pull this argument much better. So with that said, here's a pretty clear kind of view that actually gets you this result. So the view that we're developing is a form of moral contextual. So on this kind of form of moral contextualism we're going to be talking about, you have to enrich this conversational context so that it includes a number of different elements. So one thing it's going to include is this context set, just in a very traditional kind of stomach carrying way. It's just the set of possible worlds. It's the set of worlds that we're regarding as live possibilities. They might really turn out to be correct. They might turn out to be actual. The second thing, distinct from that, is a set of norms. So they're just a contextually specified set of norms, the norms that we're operating with in that context. And then the core idea of moral contextualism then is that when you utter a moral sentence that will make a moral claim, the truth of your claim can only be understood relative to something that's determined by this context of utterance. So if I say um, that's morally bad, it's not that everything is either morally bad or morally not or not morally bad in a way that's invariant across contexts. You have to assess my claim that something is morally bad relative to the, the norms that were picked out in my context of utterance. Then the claim further is going to be that when you make um, moral claims, you're proposing to update both um, the claims about the facts about the world and claims about the norms that are uh, um, the norms of this context. So if I say what Dylan just did is more than that, I'm proposing to move to a context that picks out certain sort of claims of certain sort of worlds, of, um, thereby saying which thing Dylan actually did and which thing he didn't do, and also certain kinds of moral norms that say certain things are bad and certain things are not bad, and to pick out you know the combination of them such that that the moral norms can, uh, are, are permitting everything that <coughs> regarding something that Dylan might have possibly been what, what Dylan did. So on this view, there's this kind of uh, contextual parameter for norms, and when we make moral um, statements, we're proposing updates to that contextual parameter, and also the sentences that we're uttering have these truth values, so thereby hopefully we can get this notion that in certain cases you might think what someone is actually saying can be really <coughs> false, but you still want to reject the update. You want to reject the update because you don't want to move so if you don't want to allow this other person to change the, these parameters in the way that they are. So let's try to implement this basic idea. So the first thing we're going to introduce is this notion of a precise context. So this precise context is going to have three elements. And it's understood as a triple that contains the whole world, you know, the actual world, or the world of the context of the utterance. The context, the context set, which is just this traditional stone appearing context set, the set of possible worlds that are compatible with that sort of represent what we regard as live possibilities, and the set of norms. So we're not going to say anything deep about what a set of norms is, but just whatever a set of norms is, it's just something such that for any given action, you can determine whether the set of norms forbids that action or not. So then, if you're trying to assess a particular moral claim relative to, uh, to this kind of context, say, then the basic idea is that if you say some given action phi is wrong, then what you're saying relative is true relative to a given precise context if phi is forbidden by the norms that are, are given by that precise context. So, so far, what I have said is not supposed to be anything interesting. This is just moral contextualism. So, if you're familiar with the basic idea of moral contextualism, it's just one way, just a really straightforward way of implementing what moral contextualism is. Okay, now the first time that we're going to say something that actually might be more interesting. So, what we're going to suggest is that all of the facts about a speech situation, the actual situation I'm in now when I'm saying certain sentences, together are not sufficient to pick out one particular precise context. So, in any context that I'm in, it's not as though everything about the speech situation that I'm in put together can pick out one particular set of norms. There's some kind of indeterminacy. So we're going to model a speech situation not in terms of one of these things, one precise context, but in terms of a set of these things, a set of precise contexts. So the core idea now is that when I utter a moral sentence right now, the sentence that I'm uttering is going to be its truth value is going to be assessed relative to this thing that's a speech situation, a set of precise contexts. And also, the well, uh, update proposal I'm making is not an update proposal to update just one of these precise contexts, but to update this speech situation, to update a set of precise contexts. So how do we understand our truth in this speech situation as opposed to truth in a precise context? The basic idea is that if I say something, then the thing that I'm saying is true if it's true relative to all of the precise contexts you know, that are given by the speech situation, and it's false if it's false relative to all of them. And then, if it's true relative to some and false relative to the other, then it's just neither true nor false. It's just indeterminate whether it's true. So, now we've got this basic idea of what, uh, the basic idea of how to determine the truth value of sentences on this moral conventionalist picture. 
So now we understand this. What we want to understand is what am I doing when what am I proposing when I utter a moral sentence given this basic picture? Or what's the proposed optimum? So to do this, we can think about it in two steps. So the first thing we can th think is what am I trying to do to each of these precise contexts? And then the second is what am I trying to do to this set the speech situation as a whole? So to each of the precise contexts, what I'm trying to do is going to be something that we should be very familiar with to you. So when I say P, then within each precise context, one of these elements of the precise context is this, this um, context set, this stomach carrying context set. And I'm just proposing to change that context set to the intersection of what it was before in P. So you just take the intersection of what I said and the context set, and then what I'm proposing to do to that context, to that particular precise context, is to just change it to the intersection of whatever the context set was before in P. So this is a very straightforward idea, right? Like if I say, Dover is the capital of Delaware, then I'm saying, take whatever the context set is before, was before, but then just get rid of, from that context set of all the worlds in which Dover is not the capital of Delaware. So what am I proposing now to do to the speech situation as a whole? What I'm proposing to do is to take every single one of those precise contexts and intersect the context set within each of those precise contexts with P. But then also, to just, in some cases, when I do that, I might just destroy the context. By destroy, I mean I might just reduce the context set to the null set. So when I intersect, if I have all these different precise contexts, some of them still end up being pretty good precise contexts after they're being updated in the way I'm proposing to update them. But some of them, I've just turned them into, into nothingness. I've just turned them context set into nothing at all. In those cases, then we should just get rid of that, con that precise context from the speech situation. So prior to me uttering something, there was this whole set of, of different precise contexts. I take the intersection for each of these precise contexts with the um, proposition that I just uttered. If there's still some world in the context set, then that, that precise context remains, but it's just changed in the way that I'm able to change it. If I destroy the context set, then it's just out of the speech situation. So if you, can, if you think now about this way of understanding what <coughs> update proposals are, then you can see in a really straightforward way that they end up having an impact both on the norms of the speech situation and on the facts that surround the speech situation. The way they affect the facts that are presented in the speech situation is really obvious and really familiar. That there was some indeterminacy before, perhaps, in which facts were the ones being represented by these stomach-carrying context sets. And then I change those facts by just getting rid from all of the stomach carrying context sets of the not-p worlds. The way in which they change the norms is that they remove certain whole precise context from that context set. So suppose that um, it, it was um, uh, just known in all precise context that, um, that uh, Dillian, what, what Dylan was just doing was, um, um, was uh, in killing his own child. And then in some of the precise contexts, killing your own child is considered to be forbidden by the norms, and some of them is considered to be not forbidden by the norms. And then I just say you know, that what Dylan did was not morally wrong. Then I'm destroying some of these contexts entirely, and those contexts are not in this situation. OK, let's now introduce a new notion that's going to help us understand the idea of disagreement. So this is the notion of incompatibility between proposed updates. So suppose that one person proposes to update in one way, another person proposes to update in another way, there's a certain type of notion in the knowledge is that those notions are incompatible. So we can say that a, a speech situation supports a proposed update, it, which is basically just means that if you try to update that speech situation with this, um, with this update, it doesn't change at all. So in other words, the situation is already the way that you want your team. Then two, um, two um, uh, update, updates are incompatible if there's no possible speech situation that would support both. So this is a very strong notion, much stronger than what's normally required for disagreement. So suppose that, suppose that someone says, no human being could ever solve this problem. And another person says, do we just solve it? Then in the technical sense that we just introduced, those two updates would not be incompatible. Because there's at least this possible speech situation where you'd say Dorit is not a human being. And then if you shift it to a context where you think Dorit is not a human being, then you shift it to a context in which that supports both of those, those proposed updates. The proposal to update with Dorit just solved the problem and no human being could ever solve the problem. But clearly, if two people say those two things, we would intuitively say that they disagree. Despite the fact that, though that um, many of these ordinary notions, which we already in which we say two people disagree, that we don't have something as strong as the notion of incompatibility, we were at least thinking that the opposite doesn't hold. That if these two things really have the property that they're incompatible, like if you recognize that what you think is incompatible in this very strong sense, 
then you would think that you disagree with what the other person is, uh, the, the, the proposal the other person is making. And what I want to show now is that there can be a case in which two people utter a moral statement, and neither of the moral statements is regarded by the other one, would be regarded by the other one as false, neither of them is false. But despite that fact, the proposals they're making to update the context set are incompatible, and so therefore they disagree. So then the kind of broad suggestion is suppose that when you mention a context set in which there are different kinds of norms in that context set, so there are precise, different precise contexts, one of these precise contexts has norms that forbid some action phi, and the other one has norms that don't forbid the action phi. And now suppose that one speaker says that action phi is wrong, the other speaker says action phi is not wrong. Then on the semantics that we just gave, neither of these people are saying anything false, because what they're saying is neither true nor false. But they're making incompatible proposals to update their context. The sense in which these proposals are incompatible is just that one of them is trying to get rid of all of the precise contexts that have the norms that forbid phi, and the other is trying to get rid of all the ones that don't forbid phi. So because of that, each of them could recognize that the other one is not saying anything false, but they would still feel that they disagree. The sense in which we disagree is that they're to fight about the context. They're really just trying to change the context in an incompatible way. Okay, that concludes our fourth one.